So allow me to to call on patience to come and give us uh, uh, her presentation, which is environmental perspectives and current status of managing oil and gas development in the Albertine uh, Grabbing. And our full name is Patience Sereko from NEMA. You are welcome. Thank you, moderator. So as mentioned, my name is Patience Sereko. I work as an environmental monitoring officer in NEMA. I can see my presentation is coming in quite late. I will try to ensure that we cover what we have to cover in the shortest time possible. So the presentation is on environmental perspectives of, and the current status of managing the oil and gas sector in the Alberta and Grubbin. And uh, I'll have an introduction, an outlook of the Alberta and Grubbin, and then current environmental management initiatives, and then a conclusion. So that map there shows the Alberta, what we call the Albertine Graben. It runs from uh, north to south, or, of course through other East African countries, but that is the, uh, Uganda. And uh, is currently the most prospective area in Uganda in terms of the oil and gas resources. We've had 21 discoveries so far, and uh, as yet just one production license. When we come to midstream, we have uh, Ministry of Energy's plan in the development of processing facilities, including an oil refinery in Hoima. And uh, also, there will be plans to transfer oil from fields to refinery and green refinery to market. So I just put in some of these arrows to give you a picture of what it means in terms of uh, pipeline infrastructure. Many more are planned, but I just wanted to give an overview. Uh, other infrastructure developments are planned also, such as roads, airstrips, railway networks, to support the oil and gas sector. Uh, of course, we know that the downstream sector has been existing for some time. The major issues in this sector have been issues to do with fiscal planning and uh, management of environmental incidents and cleanup. Most of us here Ugandans can see this happening around us, the fuel stations coming up and uh, how incidents are managed. So this presentation is mainly uh, biased to the Alpha time grabbing, so it covers much of the upstream activities. And uh, I just wanted to give a brief overview of the environmental resources in the Alpha time grabbing. NEMA prepared the sensitivity atlas and uh, in that we highlighted some of these uh, areas of species richness in the Albertine Graben where we find that almost 14% of all African reptiles are found, 19% of all African amphibians, 35% of African butterflies, 52% of all African bats, 39% of all African mammals and 14% of Africa's plants are found in that area. So it's a species-rich place. And also we find that we have 70% of Uganda's protected areas are located in Albertine Grubbing. For instance, we have Maxim Falls National Park here and its associated reserves. Then we have uh, Kaisotonia somewhere here, it's a community reserve. We have uh, Semeliki down there, the Renzori, there are a number of protected areas within that area. And yet it's the area where, like I mentioned earlier, we've had discoveries of oil and gas resources. So that coincidental overlap of natural resources presents great challenges for environmental management, of course. But there are still opportunities to utilize the oil resource to improve the country's economic performance and people's living standards. So, Government of Uganda has therefore put in place an enabling framework for minimizing impacts of oil and gas sector on the environment. And some of these I'll be sharing with you. Starting with the legal framework. The legal framework has been put in place or is under revision. For instance, the National Oil and Gas Policy 
clearly provides as one of its guiding principles uh, protection of the environment and environmental biodiversity conservation should have been. So it's the responsibility of the licensed oil companies, for instance, protect the environment where they work or any areas in the country impacted by their operations. And uh, government plays a role of legislating, regulating and monitoring compliance. The oil and gas policy also recommended that uh, there should be upgrade of relevant environment and biodiversity legislation to address oil and gas activities. Uh, it recommended the strengthening of institutions with the mandate to manage the impact of oil and gas activities on the environment and biodiversity. And it also recommended the development of fiscal master plans, environmental sensitivity maps, and oil spill continuity plans for oil and gas producing regions and any other transport corridors. So I'll be sharing updates on some of these later in my presentation. Well, of course, the Constitution provides for sustainable management of natural resources and uh, right to a clean and healthy environment. The National Environment Act, which is the overall environmental law in Uganda, provides for a clean and healthy environment, uh, management of impacts of, develop of development projects, uh, there are many other provisions, protection of biodiversity within the Act, but I just wanted to highlight those. The Land Act also provides for management and use of land and natural resources in line with the environmental laws, specifically the National Environment Act and the regulations made therein. The Uganda Wildlife Act provides for mandate, uh, provides a mandate to the Uganda Wildlife Authority as the agency responsible for conservation of wildlife in the country. So if any activity is to be undertaken in the parks, or protected areas, or wildlife conservation areas, uh, UWA has to have uh, given, provided authorization. Uh, the, water, the Water Act provides for management of water resources, pollution prevention and management in regard to water resources. There was a question earlier about concerns for our water resources. Those are regulated under the Water Act by the Department of Water Resources Management. And then the Fiscal Planning Act declares the whole country a planning area. Fiscal Planning Act came into place 2010, replacing the old Town and Country Planning Act. We have regulations under the National Environment Act that provide for discharge of effluent. These are standards for the discharge of effluent. If any uh, industry or developer has to discharge effluent from their facility, then they have to abide by those regulations. The regulations also provide for that the, that the facility owner should uh, have in place uh, systems to manage such waste before disposal. We have the environmental impact assessment regulations that provide for how the EIA process should be undertaken. Uh, the audit regulations provide for how audits should be undertaken. Uh, the noise standards provide standards for uh, noise in certain uh, particular areas, industrial, commercial, residential. We've been having a challenge. Um, the noise standards were made in that uh, we don't expect industrial activities in parks. And so some of these are being updated to see how can the oil and gas activities uh, take place in conservation areas, for example. We have the wetlands, river banks, and lake shore management regulations, which regulate the use of lake shores and river banks. And there, if needed to use any of those uh, fragile ecosystems, one would have to acquire a permit. We have the waste management regulations, which provide for waste minimizations, and the polluter pays principle is emphasized here, that the generator of the waste is ultimately responsible for the management of that waste. And then it also provides for licensing of waste handlers, which is done by NEMA. And the institutional framework for environmental management in regard to the oil and gas sector uh, we highlighted just a few of the critical uh, lead agencies, as we call them. So NEMA is a key authority in terms of environmental management, but we, we liaise with the Uganda Wildlife Authority, the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development, National Forest Authority, local governments, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Water and Environment, uh, Ministry of Lands, Housing and Urban Development, and also Ministry of Gender. All those have the different mandates, and uh, NEMA plays a coordination and regulatory role. Yeah, just to share, 
uh, like I think it was UNBS that mentioned, the Ministry of Energy is ultimately responsible for regulating petroleum activities in the country, whether upstream or downstream, they're the key agency. So as a regulator, we liaise with this ministry. Yes, I mentioned NEMA's mandate is coordination, regulation, supervision, and monitoring of all environmental activities in the country. And that was, uh, the this authority was established by Act of Parliament, as we are aware. UA yeah, is uh, responsible for ensuring Uganda's wildlife heritage is not compromised. I mentioned earlier. While the local governments are very key partners, especially in ensuring that uh, social services sector is not impacted by any of the oil and gas activities. For instance, if a road is to be developed or removed or water sources affected, communities resettled, the local governments are very key. And we usually want to have their say before we take a decision on a project. So the existing legal framework has been enforced. However, in certain uh, sections or regulations, it may not adequately address issues of the petroleum sector, particularly the upstream issues. Like I mentioned, the downstream has been with us for quite a long time, and so has been prepared for in the regulation. But uh, upstream sector may have some issues. And so NEMA is in the process of updating the existing legislation, as, a, as well as developing uh, more legislation where it's non-existent. Just to share with you some of the legal the laws under review currently, uh, the National Environment Act is being revised. It was, uh, came into force in 1995, so that's over 10 years. And new issues, emerging issues have come up, such as oil and gas, climate change, uh, e-waste, all that is something that was not uh, put in the Act then. The National Environment EIA regulations are being reviewed to cater for lots of things that have been uh, challenges that have been experienced in the EIA process. The waste management regulations are being reviewed also to cater for a number of issues that are coming up. The national standards for discharge of effluent into water or on land. The audit regulations, the noise standards and control regulations are also being updated to include, among others, issues to do with vibrations. As we are aware, oil and gas, particularly upstream, has issues to do with vibration. We also have standards under development that have not been existent. For instance, we have draft national air quality standards. Those are also being finalized. And then OSP regulations and guidelines. I'll mention more on that later. So these are the laws being reviewed. And NEMA is engaging a number of stakeholders in those review, uh, in the review of this legislation. Uh, both government partners and uh, and the private sector are represented. So if you're in this room and you feel you are not represented there, if we have someone, to say from private sector, from uh, that organization from Shiku, I've forgotten, we, 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 we take this that the private sector has been uh, represented. So we've also developed some relevant tools to guide in uh, regulate, or rather monitoring activities and operations and uh, the environmental manage monitoring plan for the Alberta and Graben is one of those tools. This one assigns responsibility to key regulatory bodies as custodians of environmental resources under their docket. Like I mentioned, NEMA is not responsible for the resources. We have forest authority responsible for forestry. We have who uh, are responsible for wildlife. We have uh, uh, Ministry of Energy responsible for petroleum sector, transport, you know. So all these bodies, have their mandates, and this framework provides for monitoring particular environmental aspects. And this uh, environmental management plan is expected to improve performance and accountability of regulatory agencies, to improve compliance levels, because it provides indicators uh, for monitoring. It's also expected to enhance institutional collaboration. If we all know our different mandates and how to build synergies from that, it helps us uh, improve coordination. It encourages stakeholder participation in compliance monitoring because it's an open document. You can actually download it off the internet. It enhances national capacity to assess, predict, mitigate likely effects of oil and gas activities on the environment. Now, NEMA has initiated the 
collection of some of the baseline data by supporting those lead agencies I talked about, Directorate of Water Resources, Forest Authority, Fisheries, UWA, to collect the data from their respective dockets. And uh, we are establishing a repository for that data in NEMA, where it can provide a one-stop center for uh, accessing this data, particularly for the Albert and Grabbing. Now, according to the Environmental Management Monitoring Plan, uh, five major valid ecosystem components were identified, mainly relating to aquatic environment, uh, terrestrial environment, physical chemical issues, mainly related to water, air quality, uh, societal issues, and management, of business, and management and business issues. For instance, we have tourism in the parks. Those are business issues that have to be uh, incorporated. We need to look at the impact of oil and gas on those. We also have the Environmental Sensitivity Atlas for the Alberta and Grabe. This atlas was developed uh, to highlight the general environmental sensitivity of the Alberta and Grabe. Some of the images I showed earlier were from that atlas. And uh, sensitivity issues assessed included biological resources, the water resources, the cultural sites, forestry, wetlands, soils, and settlements. So I think you can see it covers both biological, physical, chemical environment, and also social environment. Now, the information in the sensitivity atlas was the first baseline study undertaken for the upper time grabbing and forms the basis for future monitoring. Now, this atlas is broad. Some of us will look for detail in that. You may not get it. It broadly identifies, for instance, where areas of species richness. And now the studies of the environmental monitoring plan are going into detail to fill those gaps. We also finalized the strategic environment assessment. This was spearheaded by the Ministry of Energy and uh, mineral development. The strategic environment assessment is specific to the Alberta and Graben, looking at the future perspectives of the development of the sector, the oil and gas sector, and it's meant to ensure that environmental issues are broadly considered and integrated into major decisions uh, connected to policy, plans, programs associated with the oil and gas sector. And uh, I think you heard earlier a presentation from the oil companies that they are referring to this document. <coughs> This document is yet to be uh, adopted by Cabinet. The National Spill Contingency Plan is under development. It has not been in place. We've been having the downstream sector, and earlier I mentioned or one of the key issues in the downstream has been incidents and management of incidents as a big challenge. Now, an environmental risk assessment has been completed, and the National Spill Contingency Analysis also concluded just uh, recently. So the next step is to develop the actual plan, identify who will be the stakeholders and that kind of thing. Also, like I mentioned, the oil spill regulations will be developed after the plan is in place, and the regulations will also be developed uh, to guide the implementation. The plan will cover all aspects of the value chain. Now, I just want to mention also environmental management initiatives from uh, key lead agencies. Uganda Wildlife Authority, has updated their general management plans for key uh, conservation areas where oil and gas resources have so far taken place. That is Queen Elizabeth National Park and Maction Falls Conservation Area to incorporate, among others, the oil and gas issues. The National Forest Authority has also prepared forest management plans for selected reserves in the Albert and Grabe. While the Department of Fisheries Resources is undertaking fisheries frame surveys on Lake Albert and the Albert 9 to establish uh, fisheries baselines, before we have going to production and development, we need to understand the baselines so that we can be able to monitor change. The Ministry of Lands, Housing and Urban Development has initiated fiscal planning in areas facing intensive pressure from oil and gas. And these include one, they'll have a basin wide uh, plan covering 25 districts. Like I mentioned, Alberta and Grappen runs from the north boundary with South Sudan to the south boundary with the Rwanda. So that's 25 districts. There'll be a basin-wide plan. And then there'll be plans for key areas where facilities are going to be most likely to be developed fast. That is Bulisa, Butiaba, Sebukoro. These are in Bulisa and Hoima districts. There are also seven towns around the refinery area that are being planned for and uh, planning for other 
rural growth centers within police and Hoima district. Currently, the planning is focusing on where our facility is being planned for this next phase. And then, but still also to mention that the Albertine Graben was identified as a special planning area. So any activity in the Graben should be in line with the planned, uh, or the looking at planned activities. The Directorate of Water Resources Management has developed a compliance and enforcement strategy. While well, we've had the Uganda National Bureau of Standards in the process of updating and developing standards for the petroleum sector, and NEMA is involved in that process. So some of the key activities, uh, specifically by NEMA, I mentioned that the law provides for environmental impact assessment, and this is one of the key tools that has been used to guide developments in the sector. All projects undertaken within the petroleum sector have been subjected to EIA because uh, they are provided for in the schedule. In the National Environment Act, one of the activities that has to do mandatory EIA is the management of hydrocarbons. So all activities are in the petroleum sector have been subjected to EIA and decisions taken on the environmental aspects of the projects. I say decisions taken here because it may either be an approval or it may the authority may reject. And in this process, public or stakeholder participation is a key feature. If as NEMA we don't see public participation uh, indicators or evidence of public participation, then we are very hesitant to go ahead to take a decision on a project because the so uh, society are key. Uh, some examples of how also the EIA process has guided the uh, oil and gas activities is uh, looking at the land take and physical disturbance. We're able to limit this, especially for where there's temporary disturbance, the exploration wells and the camps, which are most of the facilities are temporal. We've always recommended that we have limited disturbance because eventually we're going to have to re restore these areas. So we want to reduce the disturbance. When we, we've had changes in siting of projects, for instance, to avoid key ecological features such as mud wallows, a key case in point was uh, a well drilled south in Rukungiri, in Renshama, where they had to shift the well part slightly to avoid a key water source for animals in the park. Then we have uh, had looking at alternatives in technology, for instance, uh, seismic techniques used in the Albertine, in the Albert Nile differed from what was used in other places on land and the rest because this was a sensitive environment, sensitive ecosystem. So we had to take extra precaution. Then also looking at pollution control, uh, it is required that all drilling waste, for example, is consolidated in licensed waste consolidation areas that exist in the Albertine Graben. We've also been monitoring operations. Now the regulators, that is NEMA, UWA, and other relevant lead agencies, have uh, particular name and who have dedicated staff who regulate monitor the activities while PEPD that is petroleum exploration and production department the key ministry or the key department as I mentioned has monitors on the ground all the time but we also require self-monitoring by the regulated community to have also records in place I think this was highlighted by a presentation in the morning from the partners that they require to have records, that as regulators, if we visit them, we should be able to see these records in place. And also these records, uh, reporting is done to us either through environmental audits, through monitoring reports, or as may be required by us or any other lead agency. When we talk about waste management, I mentioned earlier that the generator of the waste is liable according to the waste management regulations. And so waste handlers are licensed by NEMA and these companies or the generous generator is required to use or to contract a licensed waste management company to handle their waste. And these companies also, the waste management companies and the operators or developers are required to report regularly to the authority. The drilling waste generated during exploration and appraisal phase, I, like I mentioned, is consolidation in waste consolidation sites licensed by the authority. And environment impact statements have now been done for have been done and some approved for establishment of waste treatment and disposal sites. Uh, sharing on that, we have one of the sites that is in advanced stages of completing. 
uh, set up of a treatment and disposal facility for hazardous waste in the Abata and Graben. This hasn't been in place, that is why waste was usually consolidated and that was meant to be temporal storage. But now we are going to have treatment facilities in place and landfills, both final disposal sites. We also undertake in capacity building of staff, particularly within the regulated agencies. The regulatory agencies, who NEMA, who are local governments, are being trained while we are having sensitization of political and other, and the general public in different fora. Well, of course, there are challenges. Uh, regulation in the sector requires a significant number of personnel with diverse technical ex expertise. So, giving an example of the EIAs, which I said is a key tool in our regulation, there are times when we can receive a large number of EIAs, and yet the staff is standard. Uh, NEMA was established in 1995, then they could receive, the authority would receive about 20 EIAs in a month. Now we can receive as many as 200, 400 EIAs in a month, depending on the period. So the regulated community may experience delays because, I mean, we, we need to look at these documents and take an informed decision. Sometimes we need to consult other lead agencies, which may take a bit of time. So what we ask the regulated community to do is that submit EIAs in time to enable the authority be able to look through these documents and take an informed decision. Otherwise, many developers submit when they are ready to start operations. Not only in the oil and gas sector, even other developers. That way you will experience the delays. We need to understand that, for instance, EIA is a planning tool, so it should be used when planning for a project. The institutional framework uh, exists, but the level of readiness among the different institutions varies. Some institutions have prepared themselves for the sector. Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development, for example, has been in the sector for long and has prepared their staff. But when you look at the local governments, for instance, we still need to train the people down there because they are key. The funding in the different institutions still varies. Then I talked about the legal and regulatory framework. It's still undergoing review and should incorporate issues to be addressed along the whole petroleum value chain. High expectations and anxiety was mentioned as one of uh, key challenges in the sector. People fear the, the negative perceptions towards the sector. When uh, the CEO Zeal Technologies actually raised the issue of making blocks out of uh, waste, it's a good initiative and it's, it's something that would be welcome, but I don't know if it would be taken on well even for fencing in Uganda. That's something that would provide a lot of sensitization. Then some companies have not prepared themselves to meet up the required standards. We've been, been doing certain things in Uganda, we've been handling certain, I'll give you an example of hazardous waste. But now the kind of waste we are talking about, it's something new. So companies have to be prepared to meet up to the standards that are required in managing such waste. Earlier on, I raised the question of liabilities. Some of the companies or developers don't understand what this means. That if something came up in the future, are we ready to handle it? Or what precaution have we taken and do we think it is really adequate to minimize the risk of something occurring? Then environmental sensitivity, many fields like I mentioned are, made, are located in the Abertine Grabe, which is a highly sensitive area. Some people still do not believe that oil and gas resources can, ex can be extracted or produced or used without compromising greatly the integrity of the park. Yes, the park will not be the same as it was before oil and gas. We have more vehicles, we have more disturbances. But what we want to do is to minimize the impact as much as possible. I will tell you that uh, this last year, when there was a lot of activity in the park, so many exploration wells being drilled, Maxion Falls National Park still came out as a tourist destination of the year, a place to go. So which implies that Uwa and Neymar and our partners were able to keep the oil and gas activities impact as low as possible to the tourism industry, which is key in this country. So we believe that with good regulation and uh, implementation of mitigation measures, we can be able 
we can be able to minimize the impact of the sector. So in conclusion, uh, commercial quantities of oil and gas resources have been discovered in the upper time graben, and the developments in the sector are expected to increase. Like I started my presentation, I said they're planning pipelines, refinery, processing facilities. These things are coming. So now harmonized development of the sector will require that the requisite technical personnel, appropriate legal framework, and infrastructure are in place to support these developments. And I just bulleted out those points as a reminder of what I've discussed earlier, that the legal review regime exists and is under review. Some tools are in place while others are being developed. The institutions are in place and some of them are being strengthened. Funding is available, although this will need to be provided for all the relevant institutions. I thank you for listening. I would like to welcome uh, uh, our main sponsors of this uh, conference from Taro. You will be giving us thorough presentation of what they are doing as Taro uh, to make sure that uh, we get out of this without any scratch. Uh, I will make the other bits after he has presented. So he has two parts to present, and uh, let's listen, and then during the comments and questions, we can interrogate. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not the main presenter, I'm just the last one. Um, so yeah, I have two, two small presentations. First of all, I should introduce myself, I guess. My name is Philippe Bouzet, I'm with uh, Tello Oil. Uh, I've been here uh, four years now, so I'm starting to know my way around this project and the environmental issues. Um, however, I'm not talking on behalf of Tello, I'm talking on behalf of, my, of the three part of the partnership as uh, Ronald did this morning. So. Uh, this first presentation was actually a follow-up to Ronald's presentation this morning, so I'll, I'll basically um, present it a, a little bit as a, an illustration of some of the uh, comments that were made earlier this morning. Uh, then I'll have also a short presentation on, on some other planning activities uh, which were undertaken, and I believe they, they do answer some of the questions that, that, that were raised and also uh, provide a nice follow-up to the presentation just made now by uh, by patients. Um, how do I proceed? Yeah. This thing. So the, the, the title is, is Best Practical Environmental Option Analysis for the Management of Drilling Waste. Um, you, a bit, uh, uh, sorry about that. It's it's yet another presentation on waste, but again, uh, hopefully that will that will give some clarity as to who some of the uh, challenges that that we're meeting and how we plan to uh, to answer them. Uh, so this is basically the outline of the presentation. Um, do you all hear me properly? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. So basically now a quick outline of the presentation. I'll talk a little bit about, uh, provide a little bit of a background, talk about the BPO process, what it means, what it is, uh, and, and how it is, it is being conducted, and what are the conclusions that um, uh, were agreed. Um, this has been already said, uh, perhaps on several occasions this morning, there's going to be a lot of drilling in the, uh, in, in the graben. <laughs> 600 wells. We've drilled so far, I believe, something like uh, 60, 70 wells. So it's going to be much more activity in terms of drilling as before. Um, and we have, we are expecting to produce uh, two to three hundred thousand tons of cuttings. Uh, just a quick word, um, so that we all talk about the same thing. Uh, when you drill a well, you, uh, you send a rotating tool in, into the ground, which, which grinds the rocks. And to bring the rocks back, back to the surface, you need drilling mud. And that is what we talk about when we talk about mud, uh, drilling mud system. Um, the drill cuttings, the pieces of rock that uh, we grind as we go down um, the earth, if you will, as well as the uh, residue from the mud system, constitute what we call uh, drilling waste. There's two types of mud system. Uh, 
water-based mud is one of them. The second one is what we call synthetic-based mud. There was a lot of reference this morning about oil-based mud. I think it's been 20 years since this industry has abandoned the use of oil-based mud. What we use is synthetic-based mud. Why? Because it's not toxic. Okay? So, I, I just want to make this comment and certainly don't want to go into a discussion and then dismiss some of the concerns that are in the room. But the drilling mud we use to drill these wells is fundamentally not toxic. Okay? That doesn't mean that the waste is automatically non-hazardous waste. But uh, to, to deal with this particular issue, I want everybody to understand that when we do drill a well, or when we do develop development wells as we will do in the future, we do prepare, as patients pointed out, environmental impact assessment. In this environmental impact assessment, we describe the chemicals we're going to be using when we drill the well. Okay? We call, as it happens, these chemicals clonor, which is a word coming from the North Sea and, and Europe, etc., which basically says that these chemicals pose little or no risk to the environment. Therefore, if you put stuff in the drilling system that's not toxic, chances are the stuff that comes out is no, no, no more toxic, toxic than what come, goes in. However, we don't ask you to take our word from it, for it. What we ask these people who continue to think that there is an issue with drilling mud, simply, we, we just want to tell them that the process we use to talk about this in our impact assessment is completely transparent. And therefore, under the, the, uh, the, uh, the free scrutiny, not only of NEMA, but also of the stakeholders. And it's only when we are able, um, the operators, to demonstrate to the agencies that our, um, our waste is or is not toxic, and to what extent, they will be able to proceed, to proceed with uh, uh, the, best, the best disposal option for this particular uh, waste. Sorry about this, but, but I mean, there's been a lot of, 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 of wording this morning, a lot of what I think is a little bit of speculation, which is legitimate in some, in, to some extent, in so far as there is a little bit of a, a, you know, a, a fear that, that uh, uh, you know, some of the, uh, the product use are going to be harmful to the environment. We are looking at it very, very carefully. We're looking at it from a design standpoint, such that we don't take on this, this particular liability. Okay? Enough with that, I'll continue with my uh, presentation. Um, there is, and it was discussed uh, uh, this morning uh, as well, there is, there is an issue of infrastructure. We're working in a remote area. Um, there is also a little bit of an uncertainty as to what is the best disposal option for this particular uh, waste. And that's a discussion that's been going on for some time. And until we do find a solution, we agreed to, um, to store these waste into what we call waste consolidation area. We have five of them now, two in block one, two in block two, uh, and one in, uh, in block three. Um, this is one picture of uh, one of the waste consolidation area in block two. And, and you can see that it's, it's, uh, it's, it's managed uh, um, you know, perfectly uh, uh, respectably uh, with, all, with all necessary precaution. Um, all together, I believe that between the three operators we have about 60,000 tons of drill cuttings um, uh, stored until such time when we do agree a final solution for this waste. Uh, one of the reasons why there is such uncertainty is not because we don't know what to do with the waste. I mean, this industry has been going on for many, many, many years, and, and we've been disposing of drilling waste and drill cuttings in many areas of the world, so we pretty much know what to do with it. But there is a, there is a, um, a process whereby we need to, to come to a, a, a solution collectively with the, with the agencies. Otherwise, we're going to uh, basically um, we, 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 we're going to develop a solution that may not answer some of the concerns that we're hearing and that we've heard over, over the last few years. So what is the best practical environmental option? That's something that's been defined in the UK. It's a method, a process that's been used, uh, not just in the oil and gas industry, but in many other industries, particularly in the, uh, in the uh, nuclear 
uh, waste industry where the challenges are probably much bigger than those that we're facing now. And it's a form of appraisal that established collectively uh, for a given set of, of objectives, the best environmental, economical, and technical option. So we take all of these parameters into account, and we try to figure out what would be the best according to the particular circumstances of the country where we operate. And we decided to apply it uh, to this particular issue, given the challenges, given the cost involved, etc. Why a BPO? One of the things that is particular to the drilling waste is the fact that you can do all kinds of things with drilling waste. At least it is perceived that you can do all kinds of things. We talked about bricks this morning. We talked about landfilling. We talked also about land farming. We talked about bioremediation, biotreatment, etc., etc., etc. So what is among all of these options, what is the best one for this particular country? And that is where we felt that to come to this conclusion, we needed to do it collectively. So the key word there is collectively. It's a collective approach. It's an approach that involves um, engagement, or yeah, I guess the word is engagement, with stakeholders. So why, drill, why BPO? Because of this quality of drilling waste. In addition to that, each of these particular options come with very, very different cost implications. If you do land farming, it's not going to cost you anything. If you landfill, the ways it's going to cost you up to 200 million dollars. So when we do we, we do go to government and tell them, well, these are our options. We better make sure that we can demonstrate to the government that this is this option is actually the one that is the most efficient from an environmental, a technical, and a regulatory standpoint. So that's the whole idea behind, uh, behind the BPO. We also need to have a solution in place when we start drilling. And everybody in this room, and particularly the uh, operators, are hoping that we'll start drilling soon. Um, this is schematically what it looks like. There is a number of stages. I'm not going to go into the detail, and you wouldn't be able to read all of that stuff, but uh, there's a number of stages. It's a very organized uh, process, um, <coughs> which start with a, um, uh, a definition of, of a we did, uh, this is one of the, one of the attributes and one of the benefits of this is that these criteria and the way we weight them, the oil industry weight them, has to do with the sensitivity of the oil industry people. For example, given that it's a process led by the drillers, the driller, you can expect the drillers to be extremely sensitive to the safety of the personnel on the drilling rig, okay? So when we did that together, uh, the drillers put a weight of 100% um, surcharge, if you will, on the weight allocated to worker safety. Uh, if you look at the second column, it has to do with worker safety. So you look at that and you see what this particular weighting, how this affects the particular uh, options or the particular solution that you have identified. And you find whether or not this particular weighting affects the ultimate outcome. The beauty of it is that you can also ask the stakeholders, NEMA, BPD, etc., to give their own weighting to these factors. And therefore, you, you model the sensitivity of the different stakeholders in this particular exercise. And that's what we did. And, and, and then you, you look at your final result and you see to what extent these different sensitivities impact the ultimate result of the analysis. If it doesn't, that means that your set of options is pretty robust, okay? So, um, coming to the conclusion, it's a lot in, uh, in a very short period of time. I hope you'll be able, you've been able to um, follow uh, some of this. But at the conclusion of this process, we agreed that slurry injection, which, in, uh, which uh, involves the grinding of the drilling cuttings and the re-injection into the formation, the land filling, and the reuse uh, performed best against all the criteria that uh, uh, we had identified. We've also uh, documented that they scored well according to the sensitivity of the different stakeholders. Okay? The reuse was the best performer, however, there is a number of issues with the reuse. We, again, we looked at bricks, uh, and there was a picture 
uh, presented from Mr. Kwaki, I believe, with the bricks that had been fabricated in, uh, in Ghana, you need to be aware that the bricks that you saw are also bricks made of waste. Okay, so it is, that creates immediately a regulatory challenge. You can't possibly sell bricks that are made of waste. So if you do want to do re uh, reuse materials, you need to declassify the material from waste to non-waste. Otherwise, you're going to be exposing yourself to liability and claims that you are getting a, a, a cheap solution to get rid of your particular uh, to, uh, of your particular waste. So. The whole process is also a way to recognize these challenges together. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not so much the end uh, result of this process that matters. It's also the the um, the, the um, how do you say the, uh, the travel, the uh, um, the journey. I was looking for the word. Sorry, the journey. Thank you. Uh, so uh, this is how it works. We found also that landfilling is a very, very appealing option simply because it can be implemented now. The regulatory framework is available. There is a landfill being constructed for the legacy waste. Um, uh, so uh, it, it's there. So it, it's, good, it's good to know. Um, the pre-treatment is expected. We will need pre-treatment on all of these options. It's also a finding. Um, we also found, and it's important for us as well as for the government of Uganda, we also found that some of the cheap options are actually not very good, yeah, from an environmental standpoint. And therefore you eliminate this uh, inevitable challenge to whatever you're going to be proposing because of the cost involved. Okay? And it's good to understand that together. Um, the, similarly, the cost of slurry injection and landfilling is acceptable. Uh, given the benefit that these solutions provide to the country. Uh, the outcome is not sensitive, the uncertainties identified, uh, and one of the key criteria that we felt was going to be overwhelmingly impacting the ultimate outcome is actually irrelevant. It is the transportation safety. Why? Because it applies similarly to all of these options. So it, it's interesting. I mean, uh, we haven't found anything groundbreaking, if you will, but we went through a process together with the stakeholders and therefore have a completely transparent uh, transparent proposal for our next step in terms of waste management. Um, I think I will leave it at that. Uh, there is some further challenges. Uh, as, as I said, reuse is a good option, but it requires further E uh, examination with, with NEMA in particular and the regulators to see in the, under what condition it can be used. Um, and we need to do the same thing for slurry reinjection. Uh, so there, there is further challenge uh, uh, that and, and further findings that we will follow be following up on. And I will finish with that. I see that my uh, chairman is becoming impatient. So thank you very much. So without hardly breathing, I will move on to the next presentation. If you want to uh, hold on to your question, I believe it's best if we, uh, if we do that. The, the next presentation, I felt that, we felt that it was, um, uh, it was appropriate for, um, for us to talk a little bit given, you know, some of the comments that were made this morning about the biodiversity the sensitivity of the area just basically um, present some of the planning work, very briefly again, uh, please bear with me, I know it's been a, a long day, but uh, we're coming to the end of it, and there's plenty of nice pictures, so uh, be patient. Anyway, to, to, to show you some of the planning work that is involved uh, and that is being undertaken by the operator. Apologies for that, it shows Tolo Oil, uh, it's actually applying again to the three partners. There's a little bit of focus on block two, but the same uh, is, is also happening in block, uh, in block one and in block three according to the particular circumstances. Um, yeah. Um, what I'm going to, going to be talking about is a biodiversity-based life survey. I mean, you all know that when you do an environment and impact assessment, part of the process involved the baseline survey. You need to understand under what, in what conditions 
the particular topic that you're looking at, in this case biodiversity, and what conditions biodiversity exists prior to you starting your activities. And we are about to start the development activities which are going to involve considerable work in the field. So we need to do that. It's part of the due process. You all, you all know that. Um, so you need to establish the biodiversity context. You need to identify the potential implication of the development. Uh, you need to, um, to inform the impact assessment. So you need to understand what's going on in this particular area to inform the impact assessment. And then you need to, uh, uh, to use that as a basis for monitoring in the future. Uh, it's very much in line with what NEMA has been doing, with the Albert and Raven management plan, the sensitivity at last, etc., etc. Uh, it's, uh, and I'll, talk, I'll come to that a little bit. I want to step ahead of myself. Um, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the relationship between the two. Um, it is a phased approach for us. I mean, we need to do it at different scales because we're looking not only at direct impact, but also indirect impact, and therefore there are different scales of studies that need to be undertaken. And that's what it says here. Um, there is not just biodiversity, it's one of the baseline, that's for illustration purposes, not just biodiversity, but there is also uh, other uh, baseline survey going on, archaeology, social, uh, groundwater, uh, surface water, etc. We are talking about the physical and the social environment. So, um, let me just... Um, give you a little bit more of the background. Uh, how do you design your uh, biodiversity baseline? I was hoping to have a... Uh, this one? Yeah. So this is basically, uh, again, uh, apologies for that, it's, it's focused on block two. You can see block two is here, yeah? Block one is obviously to the north and block three is to the south. Um, Again, the same is, is, is happening in, in these two blocks, but this is focusing on block two. And once you do, what, when you plan for this particular baseline survey, you start to, uh, by wondering what parameter you want to cover in this baseline survey. And you find that the parameter goes much larger than the block two itself. Why? Because you need to take the physical and environmental conditions into account. Uh, and these conditions are not limited to a, a, uh, the boundaries of any particular block. So you need to, in this particular case, we took as uh, an aerial uh, coverage the overall um, catchment, if you will, in, the, in this particular area. There's obvious reason for that. Um, you know, I mean, the biodiversity outside of development area may be affected by associated facilities. So there's no, no artificial boundary, but physical boundary is there. Uh, the people residing in the development area uh, will depend on ecosystem services. It's a concept that is related to biodiversity. Um, uh, and there is also dependence from the development on ecosystem services. Water is one of them. We'll need water. It's an ecosystem services. We'll need an area that is not subject to too much erosion. So all these things are part of what you call ecosystem services. And it's part of this particular baseline survey. We talked a little bit about carbon sequestration. Or did we? No, perhaps we didn't talk about carbon sequestration. Perhaps another time. Um, the, um, how did we go about this? Uh, well, as you normally do in any of these surveys, you just basically uh, look at the uh, regulations and you, um, and it's important, by the way, uh, to tie in with the earlier presentation, is that we try also not to duplicate what's been done by the government. And to do that, we do a desktop survey. And we basically look at all of the data that's available. Okay? And so, this is what we call a phase two, and that's what we did. We, we do have a lot of information as partners. We've done a lot of uh, impact assessment for the exploration and appraisal activities. Uh, the agencies, the government agencies have a lot of information. We've looked at all of that and basically developed a set of data that allows us to say whether the baseline conditions are properly informed or not, and where the gaps are, okay? What I'm going to be talking about is this first phase one. The phase two is ongoing now, which is basically aiming at uh, filling these gaps. Uh, but what I will um, show you is the result of this phase one. 
Um, we looked also quite a bit uh, from a desktop perspective at satellite imagery and satellite imagery coming from 2002 and 2012 and by looking at both we were able to look at how this particular area is changing over time. That's very important the baseline survey. You can't do a baseline survey without doing time um, time-lapse analysis, if you will, and, and try to figure out what are the trends and what are the factors which are impacting on this particular uh, area. Um, so this, what, this is what it says here, uh, and then we went into a gap analysis and scope of phase two, and uh, so that uh, I, I repeat myself, but the phase two is ongoing now. So, um, looking again at the uh, um, sorry, the, uh, the legal review, um, there is a mention here of IFC. Um, the, the reason why we mention IFC is, is basically because it is adopted uh, by this industry and many other industries as the best industry practices when it comes to environmental and social management. So there is a little bit of a tendency to us to say, well, we are complying with IFC, uh, and it's a little bit unfortunate because what we want to comply with is basically what IFC is saying. And what IFC is saying is a very, very reasonable, but also very ambitious way of managing these issues. So we look, we look quite systematically at uh, IFC. We consider them as best international practices. Uh, we have uh, all uh, of the three operators their own uh, set of uh, of standards. Um, the, one of the things, uh, just an, an apology for going into the jargon of this, but one of the, uh, uh, the requirement of IFC, which is by the way, to some extent, uh, taken up in the, uh, in the, in the, in the, in the broad uh, legal framework of Uganda, if I go with the uh, Convention of Biodiversity Conservation, is um, an issue of criticality of habitats, and there is two types of, uh, uh, actually three types of habitats, but uh, um, uh, the, the most sensitive of these are what we call uh, critical habitats, okay, and they're based on uh, certain feature uh, of the ecosystem, they're based on threshold of uh, certain species, chimps, uh, giraffes, uh, and other endangered species, etc., etc. This has huge implication for the development because if we do apply these standards and we will, there's very little other options, we will need to demonstrate that there is no loss of biodiversity. And in certain cases we'll have to demonstrate there is net gain in biodiversity. And just the process of establishing the baseline condition which allows you to demonstrate that there is no loss or net gain is a fairly complex uh, process. So that's where we got ourselves into. Um, so, um, some of the things I just wanted to show to you, uh, just to illustrate how complex uh, this whole issue of biodiversity management is, has to do with uh, land cover analysis. I'm not going to spend too much time on these, these are some of the uh, uh, sampling point. Uh, point. Uh, by looking at the satellite imagery, we uh, redefined a little bit or updated what we knew about the land cover uh, in the area. Uh, the different colors represent different type of cover uh, and how it behaves uh, with time. So that's what it looks like at the end of the exercise. But more importantly, uh, uh, we've also looked at how this area was changing over the years, and that is between 22 and 2012. Ten years. Um, ten years. Okay, so this basically, the green stuff, this is looking at small scale farming. Okay? So the green, uh, highlighted green area, are gains in small scale farming between 2002 and 2012. In this particular area, uh, the green represents more small-scale farming, okay? So if I go to the next slide, the red uh, shows 
reduction in small-scale farming. Generally, they are associated with large-scale farming. It's not an area that goes back to its natural state, but rather is taken up as a large-scale farming. This is, again, desktop review with limited ground truthing, but not much. Uh, and the gray area is basically no change. Okay, so this is what it looks like in terms of this particular parameter. If you look at, uh, uh, this is giving you more detail in the Bolisa area, but let's move on to grassland. Same thing here, green is uh, grassland that uh, have regained over the last 10 years. Yeah. Uh, the red is the loss of grassland and the grey is the no change. And you can see that in the Kwaboyal Wildlife Reserves, obviously the reserve has played its role and there is very little change or less change in this area than here. Grassland is one of the critical habitats in this particular landscape. So if you look at these in sequence, you find that the losses in grassland, which is a critical piece of the Murchison Samliki landfall, correspond to the increase in small scale farming. Okay, and you do that for um, uh, many things, including mixed forest and woodland, and you find that there is some recovery of mixed forest towards Murchison Fall. It's more related to the fact that in 2002 there was a lot of burning that has recovered since then. Uh, there, is, um, a, there is quite a bit of loss of mixed forest, and then there is the national forest area, which have been protected by virtue of their designation. However, you can see that even though they are protected, there is some encroachment on the edges of this particular area. Just uh, all of that to say how difficult it is to manage risk, environmental risk, direct and indirect impact in an area which is under tremendous changes and under tremendous pressure. Um, this is a little bit early in terms of conclusion, etc., etc. There are a lot of studies that are ongoing right now. But the, the, um, the simple conclusion to this uh, type of analysis is that if there is a proper environmental and, biology and, and biodiversity management in the area, it will have to be a collective one with the agencies, with the donor agencies, etc., etc. And we are planning to continue this dialogue and use this kind of data with the government of Uganda uh, to continue to work on this particular issue and what is the best, what are the best options in terms of uh, in terms of um, in terms of management. Just uh, briefly, and I will finish with that. The this is a, a recap map of the area. Again, you have block two finishing here, and you have uh, uh, block one, year one, up here with Murchison Four National Park. Uh, the green stuff represents critical habitat under the definition of, of best industry practices uh, by all kind of, uh, by virtue of, of their original designation as part or important bird area, etc. The red stuff is modified habitat, yeah? You can have here the Koboya Wildlife Reserves and the, uh, uh, the uh, Kaido Wildlife Reserve. Uh, however, a lot of the development will also take place in this area, and you have yellowish color here, which uh, indicate natural habitat, potential critical habitat, and that's what the phase two is doing. That, I will leave it at that because the time is flying. Um, but it just, it just gives you an illustration of some, some of the planning work that are required for this kind of development and the complexity of the environment in which we're going to be implementing this project and the, the, um, um, how should I say, the importance, the criticality of, of working together with the agencies and with the stakeholders to achieve something meaningful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Felipe. You may now take uh, your seat. And then uh, we have about six minutes to our cocktail. Actually, five. So I will allow uh, 30 seconds, each one, two ladies and uh, two gentlemen. A question, and please keep it short so that we can have a breather before the, uh, the cocktail. Uh, so I will do the transportation of the mic as well as picking of the questions. This is 
young Moloch on the machine right group. Um, a question for the lady from Nima. Um, I congratulate you on your consultation program. However, what teeth are Nima going to have to enforce your recommendations? Did you get it? If you could just make it higher. Hello, young Moloch on the machine group. What teeth are NEMA going to have to follow up on the recommendations that they have made? Well, I think it is directed to NEMA. What if NEMA has to follow up on the recommendations? I think uh, he needs to know whether NEMA is that tight on following up what the recommendations have uh, been done. So I need to another gentleman and the lady, and I mean, and two ladies. Thank you. I'm Prosi Nevakara from the International Bureau of Standards. My question goes to NEMA. Uh, NEMA talked of some standards, one of them was the, the noise standard. I was just asking, are these standards or guidelines? If at all they are standards, can they really give us an overview of how they evolve these standards and how they are approved? Okay, to, make, to emphasize it, uh, you talked of standards, the noise. Noise, so how are they developed, how are they uh, approved, EDC. Another lady and a gentleman, and then... Uh... No, my name is Rebecca, uh, from Millennium Eco Environmental uh, Firm. Uh, my question is to the lady from NEMA. I thank you for the presentation and all the information about what NEMA has set up in environmental management in Africa in uh, Considering the sensitivity of the area and uh, all the, the, the setup which has been made by NEMA, uh, as an, I'm an environmentalist, I'm very concerned of the area and what are the plans if we consider that oil is non-renewable uh, resource and uh, what uh, the resources in the area in terms of uh, bi biodiversity, they are very variable. Are there plans uh, with NEMA that in the future or after uh, extraction of oil, are there plans that the simplification of uh, extraction of oil so that the area will be preserved in the future. And the second question is uh, regarding the environmental standard as in guideline you have mentioned concerning noise and others. Is the drilling mud one of the the, 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 the aspect of uh, name that you said is a, a guideline for the drilling ones because there are occasions where the drilling marks can be selected by oil companies on base of the, 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 the price if it is uh, cheaper or expensive so they can consider that. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Once again, I'm um, Gilbert Mjeni from Uganda Petroleum Institute, Chugumba. Uh, my question goes to Mr. Phil. Uh, you said for the meantime, the best method you are using to treat the drill cuttings, uh, it's a landfill. And in the Albert and Graben, it's uh, in the Rift Valley and it's a region that is most affected by tremors in Uganda. So I don't know what measures you are putting in place because with time uh, these drill cuttings tend to produce radiations as they go on for some time so I don't know in case the treatments happen and we get to have these landfills broken what will happen to our ecosystem within uh, as a result of the radiations thank you Okay, thank you all. Uh, I, uh, I guess uh, questions were noted clearly. 
I am sorry, I can't take more questions because, as I said, we have a cocktail which uh, they are saying is ready and is getting cold. The dancers have rehearsed and they are already anxious to dance for you. So I may, let's make sure that we keep it short and we go for our cocktail. <coughs> uh, thank you. Thank you for your, uh, your question on, on, um, on waste and I suspect that uh, uh, there will be yet further, further questions as we go along on, on, on waste and it's, it's, it's quite normal. First of all, the landfilling is not the, op the only option that was selected as per that process. The three preferred options, uh, landfilling, reuse and slurry reinjection, which amounts to uh, reinjecting the, 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 uh, the canes, uh, ground, uh, into, the, uh, into the, the formation. So I suspect that at the end of the day, uh, the uh, ultimate um, disposal will involve a little bit of these three options, or one or two of them. Uh, uh, we will we'll see it as we continue to uh, engage our stakeholders. Um, there is no radiation associated with the 12 pellets. Um, if there was, uh, obviously that would be taken into account. Uh, there is no uh, radiation associated with it. I, I just don't know. You need to, I hate to say you need to take my word for it because uh, you don't have to. Um, but uh, the, the process in, uh, by which we do examine these cuttings will, will convince you, uh, and by the way, under the supervision of NEMA, that we look at all uh, possibilities. Radiation are associated with production of, sometimes, um, production of uh, oil and gas. So if that is an issue uh, that, that will only come later during the uh, during the development phases, and we'll look at it very, very carefully. At this stage, there's no radiation associated with these studies. Uh, uh, Thank you for the questions. Um, I start with Rebecca. She talked about, uh, I think what you're asking is, am I involved in selection of drilling mats, or the companies you want? Yes, we are involved. As uh, Philip mentioned, uh, well, best mats are not used in Uganda. The ministry, which I mentioned again, Ministry of Energy is the line agency responsible for the petroleum sector. So both the ministry and NEMA, eh, the two parties in consultation, will approve or disapprove whatever mats you have to bring in. They're using synthetic best mats in Kingfisher after the approval of NEMA and providing stringent conditions for the use. So yes, NEMA is involved. And PPD monitors whatever is happening at a particular drilling site. So. You can't even get it in. Then you ask about what happens after the oil and gas. I think that is the purpose of this planning phase that we are in. I mentioned that we've done quite well in the exploration phase, uh, looking at uh, particularly involving all stakeholders in both the planning and monitoring. The partners earlier on mentioned that they're having regular meetings with the different stakeholders. And I believe UWA UWA has really been involved in this process. So we expect that tourism will continue even during the production and probably after. The government of Ghana does recognize that this is a finite resource and that these other resources, biodiverse resources, have been supporting the country. So there's no way we're going to compromise that. I would like to provide assurance to Ugandans, like Philip says, believe me. Um, noise standards. An overview of how they were developed and the approval. The noise standards were developed around 99, probably the 99, 2000. Yeah, there are regulations, noise, noise standards, there are regulations, but in there they provide, for instance, for residential area, what should be the minimum, maximum, and uh, the like, commercial, industrial. So they were developed then, but are being updated to include any other things. And by the way, they are being implemented. We have, for instance, the Environmental Police Force that uh, operates within Kampala and the surrounding areas, and also in some deselected districts, which is enforcing those, uh, okay, assisting in the enforcement of those uh, regulations. Then how much, uh, that was from Gimach, and the, he was asking, how will these recommendations, or even the laws after they've been reviewed, how will they be implemented? Now, like I mentioned, NEMA 
is an agency responsible for regulation, monitoring, coordination. We work in line with other uh, agencies. So whatever sector it will be, NEMA will not work alone, but with the relevant lead agency. In the petroleum sector that we're talking about right now is Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development. And they are on ground. Like uh, it was mentioned also by UNBS, they always visit, for instance, petrol stations to verify. It's the same case with the upstream and midstream sector. That's the way it will be. In liaison with NEMA, we shall enforce these laws. So I would like to assure you that uh, at least these laws will be enforced. Thank you very much. Uh, there is just one part uh, which you didn't uh, clarify on, that uh, oil is a, a non-renewable resource compared to the di uh, biodiversity and the, uh, the wildlife we have. But I guess you'll be able to expound that on the dinner, I mean on the cocktail. Uh, in that respect, I would like to recoil the uh, announcements of the cocktail. It's a long poolside. The only ticket you got is your tag. On the station where I work, I normally help my community to know uh, their solar system by showing them how the moon looks like using a telescope. And I uh, sneaked out one from the university. And uh, in case there are no clouds, at the venue of the cocktail, I'll put it somewhere where you can also look at the moon through a telescope and have that opportunity. Uh, I don't want to take so much of your time. Tomorrow, it's, it will be business as today, and we shall make sure that everything is full to the dot. The challenges we had uh, today, we apologize. The successes we had, we should celebrate together. And uh, after the dinner, I may not get an opportunity to address you again. So from here, I would like to thank you for the cooperation for the day, the attention, and please come with it again tomorrow. Don't leave it at home uh, tomorrow. And uh, after the cocktail, have a safe journey to your places of resting. Uh, see you at the cocktail.